In late 1980, Digital Research Incorporated had the number one personal computer operating system, CPM, and none other than IBM was knocking down their door, eager to license it for their upcoming PC. But by 1991, they were struggling to compete in the operating system space and ended up selling the company in a last-ditch effort to do so. What happened? This is LGR Tech Tales, where we'll be taking a look at noteworthy stories of technological inspiration, failure, and everything in between. This episode covers the story of digital research and CPM. Gary Kildall wasn't always interested in computing. His story in the industry began at the University of Washington in Seattle in the early 70s, where he was studying to become a mathematics teacher. After earning his degree, he ended up teaching at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, which just so happened to be within earshot of Silicon Valley. It was here that he learned about the first commercially available microprocessor, the Intel 4004. Being a mathematician, he became interested in programming in order to learn more about it and even started consulting for Intel and writing software for their new systems. After earning a doctorate in computer science, in 1973 he developed operating software for the Intel Intellic 8 called Programming Language for Microcomputers, or PLM, alongside its Control Program Monitor, or CPM, to operate the floppy drive. Intel liked PLM, but didn't see much of a use for CPM. Gary saw otherwise, so he and his wife Dorothy started Intergalactic Digital Research in 1974 at their home in Pacific Grove, California, later renamed to Digital Research Incorporated, or DRI. Gary developed CPM into a fully-fledged operating system, changing the acronym to stand for Control Program for Microcomputers in the Process. It was made up of three components, the BIOS, the basic disk operating system, and the command console. Each of these worked together to let multiple programs work with different hardware in a standardized way, which was crucial to provide a complete operating environment for the myriad personal computers coming to market. Machines from MITS, MSI, Northstar, Osborne, KPro, Exidy, Xerox, and hundreds of others all relied on CPM to operate. It was even used used in engineering data analysis hardware and roadway traffic counters for a company called Trafo Data. And every time a new personal computer came out, it was a good bet that it would support CPM. Well, until this company called IBM came along and announced they were venturing out of the mainframe and business machine market and entering the personal computer market. Naturally, CPM was the obvious choice for their computer, since it was proven, well-documented, and was the market leader by far. But remember that traffic counting company, Trafo Data? They'd since moved on to making CPM add-on cards for various computers and had renamed themselves to Microsoft. There was some confusion about their products, and IBM first approached Microsoft about licensing a new version of CPM. So Microsoft sent them onward to digital research, but initial negotiations didn't go well. When IBM dropped by, Gary wasn't in, only his wife, and she, along with DRI's lawyers, weren't keen on signing the non-disclosure agreements from IBM. When they did meet, Kildall wanted to sell CPM on a royalty basis and not make any changes to the OS, but IBM wanted to license it outright and rename CPM to PC-DOS. Further meetings were required to hash this out, but the day that IBM wanted to meet, it was Dorothy Kildall's birthday and they already had plans to go flying together, so Gary postponed the meeting. IBM started getting impatient with digital research and moved on to seek out other companies to work with. One of these was Microsoft, who still didn't even have an OS compatible with the IBM PC. However, Bill Gates and crew did know a guy who had programmed what was more or less an 8088 CPM clone, so they bought it outright and renamed it to Microsoft Disk Operating System, or MS-DOS. Suddenly, they had a working OS and were ready to make a deal, which was a step beyond anyone else. Once DRI got word of this, they threatened to sue Microsoft and IBM, but backed down after further negotiations. Eventually, a contract was drawn up that licensed MS-DOS, UCSDP system, and the upcoming CPM86 for the IBM PC. However, due to a clause in the contract that stated IBM didn't have to bundle all of them, they simply supported them as options. 
IBM ended up choosing the OS from Microsoft as the default for the machine, renaming it PC-DOS just like they were going to do with CPM86. As such, DRI was left out in the cold, receiving few benefits from this IBM deal. Now, this didn't immediately tank the company or anything, and they were still quite successful, as they were still selling CPM and eventually developed things like GEM, a graphical operating environment that debuted ahead of Windows. But as the IBM PC gained popularity, the desirability of CPM-based products waned. And it wasn't just IBM, since countless companies were cloning the PC, and each of them bought their own license for Microsoft's DOS to maximize compatibility. Digital Research tried all sorts of things to regain the market that had slipped through their fingers, from the aforementioned CPM86 and GEM, to concurrent DOS, Flex OS, DOS Plus, and DRDOS. But they simply could not compete in the long run, and in 1991 they sold out to Novell in one final attempt to dismantle the Microsoft Kingdom. It didn't work. DRDOS became Novell DOS 7, Novell DOS became Caldera Open DOS, and that's about all that remains of the digital research legacy. Gary Kildaw could have been Bill Gates. He was a contract away from making personal computer history, even more than he already did, and who knows how it would have affected his life. Sadly, what transpired instead was awful. He was understandably bitter over the whole IBM thing, withdrew from the limelight, and eventually ceased making appearances on shows like the Computer Chronicles, which he co-hosted for a number of years. He saw the end of his company, underwent a divorce, became an alcoholic, and eventually suffered head injuries from an altercation in a biker bar. He died from his wounds on July 11th, 1994, at 52 years old. And thus ends the story of digital research and CPM. What might have been is a crazy thing to imagine, but alas, all we can do is imagine and celebrate what they did accomplish, and make sure that their stories are not forgotten. And if you enjoyed this episode of LGR Tech Tales and would perhaps like to see a bit more, I promise they won't all have sad endings in the future and they're slightly more encouraging ones planned, then why not subscribe to my channel or check out some of the other ones that I have made and there's a lot of other videos that I do as well on retro computing and games and other good stuff. You can also follow and interact with me on Twitter and Facebook, which oftentimes works a little better than just leaving comments here, and even support the show on Patreon. This allows you to get episodes earlier than elsewhere, receive signed floppy disks and other cool perks if you so choose to do so, and as always, whatever you choose to do, thank you very much for watching.